baby on the deals, Nick. Project One is obviously due today. Um, is anyone going to be bold and say they haven't started yet? Is that, who, who, so who here is done? You got 100%. 15, 20%. Okay. Uh, is there any one thing that everyone's stuck on, or is just a matter of sitting through and getting through the test? I know some people have trouble with uh, memory leaks, right? That's, that's real. You gotta, you gotta fix those. Uh, any, any other high level things you guys are stuck on? No, I think the definition of the bucket idea has something to do Definition of what, sorry? Uh, bucket idea. In terms of what? What do you mean by confusion? Uh, there is a test case on grid scope the test with like the batch page. Definition is uh, not that clear because uh, with the uh, compared with the data on the slide. So, so I know several of us have stuck on that as a case for. Okay, um, and you posted on Piazza, right? Uh, yes. All right. <clears throat> um, so there's a lot of posts on Piazza. Uh, it would be helpful if you can send me uh, an email exactly what the issue is, and that way we can fix it up for next year. Like if it's a combination of like, the slides don't match with what the assignment is, or the textbook doesn't match, or that the, the Reddit doesn't match. Let me know what that is, and we can fix it and make it better. But we, we, we tried to improve it this year from, from the, the issues we had last year. So we always want to get better. OK. Uh, sorry, so homework two is due this Friday at, at midnight. Um, and then project two will be going out today. And what we're going to do this time, as I'll say at the end of the class, this is going to be broken up to two checkpoints. Because this, can be, this is what we learned from last year. Last year, I was like, oh, the buffer pool is easy. The D plus tree is going to be easy, too. So people waited to the last minute to try to do it. And then they were like, oh, shit. Buffer pool, or the, the B plus tree is hard, uh, as we'll see today. And uh, so what we're doing is we're, get, we're having a checkpoint that's due halfway through. So that, again, just make sure that you guys are, are have at least started, about it, started thinking about it and worked on it. And then there'll be a final, uh, you know, final submission where you get the full grade and everything. OK? Right, so we'll cover that at the end. All right, so let's jump into today's material. So today's lecture is entitled Index Concurrency Control. Um, and so th this lecture I actually gave last year near the end of the semester when we, after we talked about concurrency control protocols for, for transactions. And I decided to move it up front um, this year because in the same way that, that you guys sort of had questions about, oh, how do you, you know, handle updates when you're doing reads in your B plus tree? I decided to move it forward now, and that way we can talk about it uh, in the context of why the B plus tree is fresh in your mind. And you're going to need this for, for the second project. So everything up until the, till now, at least the last three lectures when we talked about data structures, the B plus trees, the hash tables, the skip lists, and all that, for the most part, we've been assuming that uh, we, we, were, we were building data structures that were going to operate with a, in a single threaded environment, meaning only one thread was going to be reading or writing to the data structure at a time. And we sort of talked a little bit about how you could do this in a multi-thread environment with lock-free skip lists, but I sort of, you know, I was sort of being very hand wavy about it. I didn't want to sort of dwell on it because I want to talk about how we're going to uh, do things correctly today. So obviously in a modern, uh, you know, a modern operating environment, a modern computers, you, know, you have now CPUs with a lot of cores. And you want to be able to, to use all those cores. It means you want to have as many threads as possible potentially reading and writing to your data structure at the same time, and you need to protect themselves from each other. So this is what we're going to be, we'll be focusing on today. And I would say also, too, it's not just in the context of having, you know, taking advantage of all the additional cores. We'll see this later on, but these, these concepts we're talking about today are old. They're from the 1970s. And back then, you had sort of one, one CPU socket with one core. You only had one sort of thread could run at any given time. But because we're a disk-oriented database, and we said that any time a thread could touch something that's not in memory and therefore has to stall because the system has to go out to disk and get it, we want to let other threads run at the same time. Right? And so this is why we want to have, uh, we want to have our data structures be protected from, from these threads updating things, uh, reading and writing at the same time. The one thing I also say, too, as a sort of a spoiler, is that everything we're talking about today is pretty much used in almost every single database system. One notable exception is actually VoltDB doesn't do any of the things that we're talking about today. Right? They actually only run single-threaded on, on, on a core. And now they're going to have multiple cores running each in single-threaded mode. But this is going to allow them to avoid all the overhead of the index concurrent control and latching stuff we're talking about today. So I'm not going to say how they're going to do it, but again, they're coming at the end of the semester. 
and, and they'll sort of explain why they, they do this approach. So this would work really well for transactions and OLTP workloads, not so great for OLAP, and we'll, and we'll see why later. All right, so the way we're going to protect our data structures is through a concurrent structure protocol. So concurrent structure protocols is this broad class of algorithms or, or methods that software systems can use to allow simultaneous threads to do things, to operate on the same object or, or thing at the same time, and being vague when I, when I, when I say thing, um, and to ensure that their concurrent operations still produce a correct result. So I was too vague, I mean vague on two parts here, the term correct and the term, the term thing. So by database thing, it could be a tuple, it could be a data structure, it could be a page, it could be a table, right? It doesn't matter. And by correctness, uh, I had this in quotes because what correctness means from one protocol to the next can depend on what their criteria is. So the sort of two broad categories of correctness could be logical correctness, meaning can I see the data that I'm supposed to see? Meaning if I, if I write something into the, the index or the table, if I go back and try to read it right away, am I actually going to see it? Or am I going to see the things that transactions or, or threads that came behind me actually updated? Will I be able to see those? And then the other term of correctness is physical correctness, meaning is the internal representation of how the, the object is being stored in memory or on disk, is that considered valid or sound? And by that, I mean there's not going to be a pointer to some, you know, some random location in memory that we're not supposed to be reading. Right? I, if I follow the data structure, I follow my tree pointers, I, you know, I see the nodes that I should be seeing. So for this, we're going to focus on the, the, the second one, physical correctness. Right? How do we make sure our B plus tree is, the integrity is sound? We're going to focus later on about logical correctness when we talk about transactions or high level transactions uh, after the midterm. And I find this really, really fascinating. My whole, you know, I spent a large portion of my, my grad student career and my early time here at CMU worried about this problem, thinking about this problem. Right? This is a really kind of cool thing to say, like, all right, I can have, I can interleave operations in any way I want, as long as it sort of comes out logically correct. I don't care how you interleave them. Whereas in the physical correctness, there are certain cases where you have to do things in a certain order. So again, we'll focus on the second one. The first one will come up later on when we talk about transactions and concurrent control for you know, higher level semantics. All right, so today's agenda, we're going to focus on uh, the different lab latch modes. And then we're primarily going to spend our time talking about doing index crabbing or latch crabbing or latch coupling. And this is what you have to implement in, in the second project. And then we'll talk about how to do leaf scans uh, safely. And then we'll talk about a simple optimization that was invented here at CMU called delayed parent update. It's sort of a, an obvious optimization, but we can sort of talk about the semantics of it. OK? All right, so I showed this slide earlier in the semester and uh, to, to distinguish between latches and locks in the context of databases. And I got the impression that everyone's sort of eyes were sort of glazed over and wasn't quite sure what I was trying to say. So I'm going to go over this again because we need to understand this for what we're talking about today. So in databases, in database systems, there's a distinguished, there, there's a dichotomy between uh, locks and latches. So locks are things that are going to use to protect logical contents of the database. Right? So you can protect the, uh, you can protect tuples, you can protect tables, you can protect the entire database. And we're not talking about underlying low-level things like here's some here's some region of memory I want to protect. That's not what locks are for. And so the the locks are going to protect essentially the logical contents of our database. In this case here, they're going to protect the logical contents of the index. And the these locks are going to be held for the entire duration of a transaction. Now, I haven't defined what a transaction is yet. Just think of it as a sequence of operations we want to do in our database. I want to update five tuples, and I'm going to do them atomically. Right? That, that's essentially what a transaction is. So any lock that I'm going to take on an object in, in, in the database, I'm going to hold that for the entire duration of the transaction. That's not entirely true, but for now, we just assume that. And then the key thing about locks is also, too, is that the there's going to be this sort of additional process or validation mechanism that's going to let us that's going to decide whether we're our transaction is allowed to proceed or not. And if not, right, because of some violation of lock ordering, then we have to abort our transaction and roll back any changes. So again, a really simple example, I need to update two tuples. I get the lock on the first one, I update it, I get the lock on the second one, but then that fails, I can't get the lock and I have to abort my transaction. So I need to roll back the change of the first one. And there's some additional mechanisms we have to implement to do that rollback. 
Now, distinguish this with, between latches. And again, if you're coming from an operating system background, this is what they would call uh, a lock, right? Like you're protecting like the underlying physical data structure of something. So this is, the latches are going to help us protect the critical sections of our index's internal data structure. Remember I said the distinction between logical correctness and physical correctness. The lock is going to protect the logical correctness. The latches can protect the physical correctness. Right? This is like the critical section. You know, we want to update a pointer to, to another node, and we don't, any, we don't want anybody to read that until we're actually done. So <clears throat> for these latches, they're, going to be, they're not going to hold them for a long time. Your thread is going to acquire a latch, do whatever it needs to do, and then immediately give it up. Right? And means you can, you, can, you can acquire and release and acquire and release the same latch multiple times during your, your transaction. And the key difference also between the latch and the lock is that we don't need to actually roll back any changes. Meaning it's sort of thing, it's an atomic operation. Either it, it happens or it doesn't happen. And we'll see it later on, but like if it doesn't happen, if I can't get the latch that I want, I can just loop back and try again. Right? Maybe just spin on it. Okay? So there's this great table from uh, the, the, the book I recommended to you guys from Gertz Graffy uh, on the, the B plus tree stuff. Um, where he's has this, he sort of lays it out exactly where locks and latches are, are how, how they're used in, 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 a, in, a, in a database system. So he says for locks, they're going to use to be separate user transactions, right? Updating tuples, things like that, and and they're going to and they're protecting the database contents, right? Tuples, pay, tuples, uh, tables, databases, and we're going to hold them for the entire duration of the transaction, and we're going to have different modes for what kind of locks we can take. For now, we can ignore all of this, just just. Right, just know that there's more nodes than there's more modes than we'll see for latches. And the way we're going to protect against deadlocks is to have a separate detection mechanism or resolution process using various mechanisms like a wait for graph or timeouts and aborts. And the information about what transaction holds what lock will be stored in a centralized lock manager. All this will make sense later on, but for now just again just distinguishing the two of them. Yes. His question is why do latches only have a read and write mode as opposed to what? Uh, intention mode. That's a read. That's a read latch. Same thing. Yeah. All right. So right, again, in, in the database literature, again, distinguishing locks and latches. There's a shared lock. You you can get a shared lock on a on a, on a tuple. You get a read latch on the, the memory of that tuple. That's the way to think about it. All right. So the, the latches are going to be used to protect threads from each other. And they're going to be only used to protect the in-memory data structures, like the B plus tree we'll, we'll be building here. So that means that we don't ever you know, write any information out the disk about what latches are being held. Because right? it doesn't make sense. We come back, we boot the system back up, these latches aren't around anymore. So we're going to protect the critical sections of our data structures. We'll only have two modes, read and write, which will go over in the next slide. And then the way we're going to avoid deadlocks or handle deadlocks is through us being good programmers, good database developers and software engineers. Through, through coding discipline. So we need to be careful about write our code to make sure that we can't have deadlocks. And the way we can avoid deadlocks is basically, if I can get the latch that I want, I have to know it, in what context I'm trying to acquire that latch. And should I wait to acquire it, or should I kill myself right away? All right? In the context of a, a transaction with a lock, that logic is, is managed by the, the, some kind of centralized coordinator, like a lock manager. OK? All right, so again. This lecture is focused on the latches, right? Because we're protecting the, the, the internal data structure of our, of, our, of our B plus tree. All the lock stuff we'll cover uh, after the midterm in lecture 17. And again, I find this, all of this stuff really fascinating. So sort of what his question was about, uh, you know, uh, can you have a read latch, like a, sh like a shared mutex? And the answer is yes, we're just calling this a read mode. So a, a, a read mode latch can you can have multiple threads acquire this, the, the same latch in the same mode multiple times. So if I come along and I want to acquire this latch, and you hold it and you have it in read mode, and I want it in read mode, then I can also piggyback off of you and also acquire it. And internally, the latch maintains some metadata to say, all right, this thread has, has, my, has me in read mode, and this thread has me in read mode. And I know that one guy releases it, it's still being held by another thread, so it's not like I released the latch entirely. For the write mode, only one thread is allowed to hold the, 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 the latch in that mode at a time. So if you, if you already have the latch in read mode and I want to get it in write mode, I can't. I have to get either blocked or wait or, or abort myself. Um, and if I'm holding a read latch, and then nobody else can acquire it at the same time that I am. 
right? So there's this sort of, uh, sort of obvious compatibility matrix like this. The way to think about this is, say one side is what the latch mode currently is in, and the top, uh, the top uh, sort of set of columns is what latch mode somebody wants to acquire it in. So if somebody holds it in read mode, I can acquire it in read mode and no other mode. And everything else gets, is, is denied. And what happens when you get denied depends on the implementation and what context you're actually trying to acquire that latch. All right, so now using these latches, we can talk about how to, we want to do B plus C convergence control, how to build a multi-threaded B plus tree. So there's two types of problems we need to deal with. The first problem is when we have two threads trying to update the same page at the same time to maybe to try to insert or update the, the, the key value pair arrays inside of it. Right? And this is sort of obvious way to fix this, right? You just take a read latch on that node, sorry, you take a write latch on that node, and only one thread is allowed to update it at a time. And then when you're done updating it, you release the write latch, and then somebody else can go ahead and update it. Right? That's, that's a no-brainer, right? That's, we, we all know that from you know, basic systems programming. The one that's more complicated, though, is dealing with traversals. Because now you could have one thread traversing down to the tree, try to get into a leaf node, and while another thread is doing an insert or a delete, that's going to cause me to either split or, or merge or move a sibling around. And that could foul up the other thread because now I'm moving, moving memory around. I'm changing pointers to now point to new locations. Right? And that becomes problematic because now we could have, if, if we have a race condition where I copy the data to a, to a new location of memory, but before I update the pointer, someone follows the pointer to the old location, but it, maybe I've already reused that memory for something else. All right, we're talking microseconds here or nanoseconds, but this, you know, with enough, you know, bad things can happen. If bad things can happen, bad things will happen. So we have to protect ourselves. So let's look at a really simple example of what this looks like. So we, sat, we have a simple B plus tree like this. Um, and then what I'm doing is I'm labeling the nodes uh, on this side, because we're going to focus on this side, just with letters so that we know what we're talking about as we go down. So say I have one thread and they want to delete 44. It's down here at the bottom. So it just goes down one after another until it reaches the bottom, following the separated keys to decide which way it wants to go. But then, uh, and then it goes has and delete this. But now our, our, our node i here at the bottom is, is not less than half full. It's empty. So we need to rebalance. And we'll do this by stealing 41 and, and from, our, from our neighbor and copying it over. But now at the same time, thread 2 comes along. And they want to find 41. So they do the same thing. They come, down, they come along down here, they get down to D, and at this point, when they look at D, they see the separated key says, oh, well, anything between 38 and 44 is at node H, so I know I need to go there. But in between this time, uh, I, I want to follow this pointer, in between this time, the other thread moves 41 over, so now I go down here, and the thing that I sh thought should be there is not there. Right? So this seems like this is sort of a logical uh, problem, right? Because like I thought 44 was there, but it's not there. But it's actually a physical thing because the data structure is telling you I should go to this, go to H, and you'll find what you want, but it's no longer there, right? Because then after the fact, the uh, right, the D got updated with the correct uh, separated key, and so any thread coming behind this should have gone to I, right? So this is essentially what what we need to protect ourselves from. So the way we're going to do this, this sort of standard technique is called latch crabbing or latch coupling. So I when I you know. When I learned databases when I was younger, they taught us at, on the term latch crabbing. Sometimes it's called latch coupling. I forget what the, the textbook says. But they, they, mean basically, it's, they mean exactly the same thing. So uh, Wikipedia might call it one versus the other. So latch crabbing is going to be a protocol that is going to allow multiple threads to access and modify our B plus tree at the same time and not have any of these, these problems. And so the, the, the idea is pretty, pretty straightforward. Anytime we, we want to uh, we enter the tree, we always have to get a latch on, on, on a parent node. And then we try to get the latch on the child node, the direction we want to go. And then if we we're able to get that latch, we move our thread down to the next node. And then we go ahead and, and, and release the parent node latch if that node is considered safe. And so by safe, I mean that we know that based on whatever operation we're trying to do, whether it's an insert or a delete, that the node that we just moved to would not need to be split or merged, meaning it can accommodate whatever the change is that may, that may be below it. Right. So if 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 my node is full uh, and I'm doing the insertion, then 
I, I may have to split that node, my parent node, so therefore, I may have to split the node I'm at, and therefore I have to update my parent node, so therefore I don't want to release the latch on my parent node. Same thing for delete, if it's, if it's less than half full, then I may have to do a merge, uh, and therefore I, I, my parent's not safe either. All right, so let's see basically how this works. All right, first search, it's pretty straightforward, right? You take relatches all the way down, right? You acquire the latch on, on your child, the one, the one that's below you. If you acquire it, you move down there, and then you always un unrelease your parent, right? Because, you know, searches are obviously read-only, so you're never going to modify the structure of the tree. If you do insert or delete, you start at the root and go down, acquire right latches all the way down. And then uh, as you go down, if you know that the, the, the child node you just jumped to is safe, then it's, you can go ahead and release the latch for your parent or anything above it. Okay? Let's look at an example. So say that our thread here uh, wants to search for 38. So we start off at the very beginning. We get the read latch on the root A. Then we jump down, uh, get the read latch on B, and then move down there. Again, right in this point here, since it's read only, it's safe for us to release the latch on A. So we go ahead and do that. Then move down further to get the latch on D. Go down there, get the latch on H, go down there, and then we're done. And we, we can read the item that we wanted, right? Pretty straightforward. And that's sort of the coupling or the, the crabbing part. The crabbing part is supposed to be like the way a crab walks. So you're, you're releasing these, these latches behind you. All right, so let's see now we want to do a delete. So we start at the very beginning. We do, we do we delete key 38 uh, here at the bottom. So we start off with the right latch on A, and then we uh, get the right latch on B, and then move down. Now, at, at this point, uh, since B is, we only have two keys in here, but since B is half four or less, we don't know what's going to happen below us at this point. Right? We only know with that our current node and the one that came behind us. So at this point here, we don't know whether the, the if we go down to D, whether it's going to have to do a merge because it's, if it's less than half full. So at this point here, we can't release the latch on, on A because we may have to merge, merge B. Right? So then we get down to D, and then now we recognize that D is, is completely full, and we're doing a delete here. So no matter what happens below us, D can absorb, if you will, any change without having to propagate it back up into the tree. So at this point here, we can release the latch on A and B, our entire lineage back up to the root. So one key thing to point out here is that we're going to release the latch, the latches in first in, first out order that we acquired them. So I'm going to release the latch on A first, followed by B. And we take a guess why. Exactly, yeah. So she said you want somebody to access A as soon as possible, right? So there's no correctness issue, right? Because if I release B here, you know, it's not an issue because no one can get to it anyway because I had the right latch on, on A, on the root. So if I release the latch on A first, right, we're talking again nanoseconds or microseconds here, but it opens up a window now where someone can come in and, and, and possibly get into our tree. And they may, they may not even be going down the same, same path that we are. They may, they may be going down another path on the other side of the tree. But again, everyone's always stymied on, on the root, I'm blocked on that. So as soon as I can release that, the better it is. All right, so then I get my right latch on, on H. I move down, uh, and I go ahead and I can delete 38. And again, there's no, uh, we're more than half full, so there's no change I need to make to anybody above it. So I didn't have to hold the latch for that. Okay? All right, let's see now an insertion. So I want to insert 45. Same thing. I start off, I get my right latch on A, get the right latch on B, then move down. And again, at this point, uh, I, I, I can release A because I, I know I have a free slot or free key space in B. So no matter what, if I have to, if I have to split below, I can absorb a new a separator key uh, at, at, at B. So we can release the latch on A. Then we get down to to the, get the latch on I, and this point here, I has room, so we can release the latch on B and D all the way. Right? Actually, in this case here, for D, going back, and here I couldn't release latch on B because I don't know what's below me at D, so I, and I don't have any more space to take another key, so I have to maintain the latch on B because I may have to go all the way up and, and do splitting. But when I get down to I, I say, oh, I have a free space, I'm not going to have to do a split, so therefore I can release the, batch, the latch on B and D. Okay. All right, so let's look at one more example inserts where you do have to do a split. So we want to insert key 25. Same thing, start off on, on A, 
get the, lead, get the right latch, get the right latch on B, move down. At this point here, B is not going to have to do a split, so we release the right latch on A, move down to, to C, same thing. We, we, we have a free space, so we're not going to have to do a split at C, so we release the right latch on B. Then we get down to F, and now we see we're going to have to do a split. So for this, we can't release the right latch on C because we're going to have to put something in there, right? Because we're doing a split on, on F, right? So we keep the latch on our parent node, and then we do our insertion, uh, update the separator key, and add, add, add our new page, right? And then once the, all that's done, we release all the latches, and now our new key of 25 is, is visible to other threads, and we're, the, the integrity of the, the data structure is still sound, right? So if anybody coming behind us is doing a lookup, right, they, if they want to look into these pages, they would get blocked at this point because they're not going to be able to get any latch on the C. Yes? So the way you judge whether a child is safe or not is to judge whether it will be slip or His question is, the, the criteria for judging whether a, a node is safe or not, I'll just, I'll just say what it is. So it's, it's if, you're gonna, if you're doing an insert, if the, if the node is not full, that means that no matter what happens below you, because you, you, you do a split, that you can, you, can have, you can have room to take a new separator key at that node, at your parent node. So therefore, you're not going to have to split that node. So you don't need to, to, to hold a right latch on that, because you're never going to get changes propagated beyond the one you're at. Right? So at this point here, going back, so we're here, we get our right latch on C, and then we jump down. And now at this point, we know we're doing an insert. So no matter what happens below here, whether we split or not, or, or, or even if we do split, that we can put it in, we have room to put a space in here. So that means that we're never going to have to split this and therefore update B. So it's safe for us to release the latch on, on B. And then when we get down here, we say, oh shit, well now we actually need to do a split. So now we can't release a latch on C because we're going to have to update it. And we, we, do, we do our split that way. Yes? So would you need like thousands of mutexes for each tree? His question is, would you need thousands of mutexes for each tree? Yes. Right, but, it, but so I don't want to get into the implementation side of things. Uh, for these, you you do wouldn't want to use like a the like a the standard standard template library mutex, which is just a, a Linux futex. Right, you just want to use a spin latch. I mean, just you have a single a, atomic like integer, and you just do a compare and swap to, to acquire it. If you can't acquire it, you spin on it. That's the, that's the fastest way to implement a, a latch. So now we're talking like in each page. I mean, you, can do, you can do a, I think the, you can do 8-bit atomic latches. Because we don't care about the value. Um, and that's not true, because if you, if you need to keep track of writers, it, it, readers versus writers, you do have to, it has to be a little bit bigger. Right? And the, the way you implement that is you could have a single counter for the, the, the write latch, and then a counter for the, the read latch, and any time you acquire it, you add one to the read latch, and, you, you know, and then you subtract one when you release it. And you can do that atomically. So we're maybe talking 64 bits per latch. It's nothing. All right. So I sort of said this already when I asked, I asked before. Uh, what was the first step that we did in, in every single case we were updating the, 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 the tree? What's the very first step? Lock the root. Lock the root, exactly, yes. Right? And if you're doing all these updates, you're, you're, you're locking it in, in a right latch mode so nobody can even read it. Right, so this becomes a major bottleneck because every single time you want to do anything, you're, you're locking the root and, and essentially making this be a serial single-threaded data structure. So this will become a major bottleneck in a highly parallel environment because everybody has to go through this sort of one contention point. Right? Even if they go down to different parts of the trees, they're always sort of starting at, at, at the same spot. So we need, a, we need something better. And so the, this algorithm doesn't really have a name. It's sort of uh, it's, it's the, sometimes named after the people, these two Germans, Bayer Schlotnick. Sometimes it's called the optimistic latching, latching algorithm. Right? It's an old thing. It's from like 1977. Right? But the idea is pretty, pretty straightforward. And this is pretty much what, what all the, this is at the, the very least what every system that uses a B plus tree that wants to be multi-threaded will do something like this. There's a bunch of other optimization we can do we're not going to cover. But this is what, every, this is what everyone does. So this better latching algorithm is considered an optimistic algorithm, meaning 
it's going to assume that if you're doing an insert or, or delete, that the leaf node that you're going to be modifying will be safe. I mean, you're not going to have to do a split or a merge. Right? And this sort of makes sense, right? Like my simple example, I'm showing nodes with two keys. But as we said before, in a real B plus tree, your, your node size is going to be at least your page size or larger. So like four kilobytes or, even, or potentially larger than that, at least in a disk-oriented system. So the likelihood that you're going to have to do a split or merge for every single insert or, or delete is, is pretty low. So instead, we're going to assume that we're not going to have to do a split or merge. And therefore, we're going to take read latches all the way down. And, and then right before we get to the leaf node, then we take, a, we take the right latch on that leaf node. And then if we find out that we are going to have to split or merge, then we, just, we, we ab abort our operation, go back and retry it, then take the right latches uh, as, as the normal protocol is. Right? The idea here is that you're going to, again, you're assuming your splits are, or splits are rare, your merges are rare, so don't take right latches because that limits concurrency. And if you're wrong, you just go back and, and restart it. Right? So let's see how this works. So we can go back and do a delete of 38. Again, we start here at the root. Again, instead of acquiring the read latch, sorry, instead of acquiring the, the latch in write mode, we'll acquire it in read mode. Uh, and then we just go down and do our, our standard crabbing and coupling all the way down. And then here, when we get down to D, we take the write latch on H, jump down here. We recognize that we're safe. We can do our delete without ever have, have to split. We release the, the, the latch on D, the read latch, go ahead and, and then do our delete. Right? It's pretty obvious. All right, so let's see now that insert on 25. So I start again, the read latch on A, read latch on B, traverse down, release that, go to C, traverse down, release on B. Then I get down to, to F. I recognize here that I'm going to now have to do a split. So therefore, I, I, I needed that right latch on C, but I didn't get that as I, as I went down because I was assuming I wasn't going to have to split. So in this case here, I'd recognize that my leaf node is not safe. So therefore, I restart everything and take right latches all the way down. So again, this, this, this is an optimistic algorithm. The surges, the surges are just the same. You take, just do reach, read, la, read latch coupling, read latch crowding on the way down. And then again, for inserts and deletes, you set latches as, as, on the way down as if you were searching with, you know, in read mode. And then you get the right latch on the, mo on the leaf node you want. And if it's not safe, you restart and get right latches. That way you get the, you get the right latches uh, that you need in, in the entire hierarchy of the tree going down to your leaf node. Otherwise, you just do it. So again, this is an optimistic algorithm because it, it's assuming that the, 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 the likelihood that you're going to do a split or merge is rare. And therefore, you're, you, you end up saving. Uh, you know, saving work and improve your parallelism because you make this assumption. But obviously, if, you, if you're wrong, then you're actually get, being worse off than you would have been if you didn't actually take this optimization because now you're actually doing sort of almost double the work. So I do my traversal with relatches, get to the bottom, recognize that my leaf node is not safe. Now I have to abort and come back and do it all over again. So that work I did to figure out that I wasn't safe is wasted. And so there are some optimizations you can do to provide hints about what's below you in, in, the, in, the, in the tree. Um, you know, they don't have to be entirely accurate all the time, but you know, the, worse you, the, the less accurate it is, the, the wronger, the more, the more incorrect your, your assumptions or approximations are going to be, and you end up actually doing much worse because you, you're, wasting, you're wasting cycles, wasting instructions, doing work that get, ends up getting thrown away. Yes? So this question is, do you always need to start at the root node? Um, so yeah, there are, um, there are some optimizations where you can have like a hash table on the side to say, hey, if you really want this key, here's the node to jump to. Um, in general, yes. I mean, so you don't have to. The, that's like an extent, that's like an advanced optimization that like people have tried. There's literature from like early 1980s that discussed this. Um, but of course now, you get, this is, what I was trying to say also too is like, you either have to make that hash table that jump, allows you to jump to a node always be in sync, or uh, you can still update it lazily, but now you may end up guessing wrong based on it, 
and have to restart and, and retry always going through the root. Right? So there, there's sort of this trade-off between like, all right, I, I, most of the time it's going to be right, and when I'm wrong, it's not a big deal for me to go ahead and, and just undo what I did. But in this case, when you're restarting, you need to go through the root. You can keep track of the bind that you restart somewhere. So his, his statement is, uh, in this example here, I can, like in this case here, I, I, I went, when I went down, I could keep track of the path I went to, and then maybe went, instead of restarting from the root, jump to another location. But again, like, I need to protect that, right? Because by the time I come back and restart, another thread could have like trashed this C or deleted a bunch of stuff, and now I'm jumping to a, a, a bad location and read garbage. So again, this is like, I would say that that approximation is is a is a bad one. Um, I, we we do this in our BW tree, which I I, I don't want to talk about here that that we implemented where we. If you want to do range scans in reverse direction, because it only has sibling pointers in one direction, you could keep the stack of how you got down there, how you got to it. The reason why we can do this in the BW tree, and it's hard to do it in this, is like in the BW tree, there's a separate mapping table that says, if you want this node ID, here's the memory address. In this, they're like page IDs, and then the page ID might, might not be there anymore, right? Because it might have got swapped out the disk. <laughs> okay. All right, so the one observation I want to make now is that in all the examples I've shown so far, we've had our threads acquire latches in what I call a top-down manner, meaning we start at the root, uh, we, get, we get the latch on that root, and then we, the next latch we want to get always has to be something that's below us, the, the node that's below us. We never go in, in the opposite direction uh, in our tree. Remember I said earlier that uh, although there's no reason you couldn't have pointers from, the, from a child to a parent, almost nobody actually implements it that way. So no, one, no one's going to be going in reverse direction. Everyone's always going sort of the top down. So the benefit of this, and it's sort of obvious, but, uh, is that you can never have deadlocks because the, the order in which threads try to acquire latches are always in the same direction. Like I can't get my latch on this, this child node that I want unless I had the latch on the parent. So nobody else is coming in the other direction trying to get the latch on the, the node that I have. So, this, so in this case here, as, as we're going down, if we try to get a latch and we can't on a node, then we can just wait. Because we know there can never be a deadlock, and at some point, whatever the thread is, is, that holds the latch is doing something, they'll be able to release it, and then we can go ahead and acquire it. All right? So again, if you're implementing, implementing this as a spin lock, we just sort of spin on, on the, the variable that, that maintains the latch, and at some point it'll, it'll change, and then we, we, can, we, can, we can acquire it, and then we, we, we can continue with whatever operation we wanted to do. And it doesn't make sense, if, also if you think about it, like if I traverse the tree and I can't get the latch on the node that I want to go to, uh, if I abort and restart, then the likelihood I'm, I'm just going to come back to the very beginning, the root, and tr come down to the exact same location again, and just get stymied or blocked on the latch I couldn't get before. So you just sort of spin and wait. But as we, people were asking earlier, I think it was last week, uh, about these sibling pointers, but how do we actually handle the case where we have threads down now, down to the leaf nodes, and they want to go left and right because we have these sibling pointers? So let's look at an example here. So we have a real simple B plus tree. We have just the keys one through four. And our thread here wants to find all the keys that are less than four. So we just do the standard uh, optimistic latch crabbing technique that we talk, just talked about. We acquire the read latch on A, then we jump down, uh, get the read latch on C, and then we can, our thread moves down to C. So now as we're scanning along, we would, we would recognize that we still need to read data on, on this, this leaf node over here, because we want to find everything less than four. So it's basically from four to negative infinity. So we want to go all the way to the end of the tree. I'm not really talking about this here, but there's things called like fence keys or, or sibling keys where you can sort of maintain uh, a hint to say, oh, by the way, if you're jumping this direction, this key starts at two. Right? There's some there's techniques to do like that, but we can ignore that for now. All right, so if I want to go now and traverse along my sibling to get to B, I have to do the same latch coupling or crabbing technique that I did before. I can acquire the latch on, on B, 
uh, unless I hold the latch on C. So since I hold the latch on C, I'm up, it's allowed to go ahead and get the latch on B, and then it moves over and to, to this node, and then it's safe for it to release C. Right? The same technique that we did before, we're just moving along horizontally. So let's look at a more complicated example. Let's bring another thread in, right? Again, these are both read-only. So T1 wants to find keys less than 4. T2 wants to find keys less than, uh, or greater than 1. So same thing. They both start at the same time. We acquire the read latch on, on, the, on the root node, A. Uh, thread 2 gets the read latch on B, moves down. Thread, thread 1 gets the read latch on C, moves down. And then now they want again, both, they want to both scan in, in both directions. And at this point here, and since the read latches are compatible with each other, the thread one can get the read latch on B, and thread two can get the read latch on C, and because that latch can be held by both threads at the same time in the same mode. And then they, they swap over, do our scan, and at this point now, uh, thread one will release the latch on, on C, and thread two releases the latch on B, and we're fine. All right, this is read only, so it's super simple. There, 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 there are no deadlocks. But now let's throw in some updates. So th thread one wants to delete four, and thread two wants to find keys greater than one. So say we start off, thread one, or sorry, thread two gets the read latch on A, uh, and say also too we're doing optimistic lock coupling. So we're gonna get the read latch on, on our parent and only get the, the right latch on, on, the root, on, on the leaf note. So thread, thread two goes down to B with the read latch, Thread one goes down to C with the right latch. At this point, we release the latch on A, because we're doing, again, we're doing a lock coupling. But now, thread two wants to scan across the leaf nodes and get the, the, the read latch on C. But it can't because thread, two, thread one already holds this latch in, in write mode. All right? So what should happen here? Take a guess. Should it wait? She's shaking her head yes. Raise your hand if you think it should wait. Oh, about half. Raise your hand if you think it should just kill itself. Raise your hand if you're a thug and think thread two should kill thread one and steal his latch. <laughs> Which is actually a real thing, just not, you know, maybe not for this. All right, so we don't, at this point, thread two doesn't know anything about what thread one is doing, right? These latches are sort of these the sort of thing of these they're just like dumb locks. I'm gonna use one to lock, but they're dumb latches. Right? It just knows it's in write mode. I can't get a read mode latch because that's not compatible with me. So I don't know, I have no idea what it's doing. So what'll happen here is rather than wait around and, and see whether thread one is, is gonna give up that latch, I'm just gonna go ahead and kill myself. Right? And abort my operation and just come back and retry it. Right? And the reason why we want to do this is because otherwise we could have a deadlock. Because like, like I said, thread 2 doesn't know that thread 1 is either you know, just going to do its update on C and then immediately give up the latch, or it's going to scan across and try to get the latch on B, which it holds. And therefore you would have a deadlock. So to avoid all this, if we haven't do anything sophisticated, we just say, oh, I can't get the latch I want, I'm dead. And restart. Right? And that makes the protocol super simple. It's not the most efficient thing, right? Because again, we can try to be sophisticated and say, oh, well, I know that it's just doing you know, a single delete. It'll give it up in a few microseconds. So it's safe for me to do it. I don't do any of that. I just say, I can't get it. I just abort and, 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 and retry. So this is how, so this is how we're going to handle Yes, in the back. Would it be more efficient if the writer kills the reader and the So his question is, would it be more efficient if the writing thread, thread one, would kill thread, um, would kill the, the thread two if it sees it waiting for the, the, the latch it holds. So if the writer needs the latch on B, it would kill the otherwise it would just, otherwise it would just So he says, the, so thread, thread two could just spin here, keep it trying to acquire the latch, and then if Thread one wants to go over to the B and sees that thread two is waiting for it, it'll kill it. Otherwise, it just lets it spin it. Um, so the first question is, where are you going to maintain that thread one is thread two is, is spinning for the latch on C? 
right? You have to maintain that somewhere, like some global data structure, right? Or you have to you have to have your thread look through every single location of every every transaction or every thread that could be running and say, hey, are you waiting for the thing that I have? Right? You can do it, but it's a bunch of extra work and it's not worth it. And this makes coding this thing way more way harder. Right? So it's just better off just to immediately kill yourself and then just retry it. We'll see something like this when we talk about trans like transaction locks. But in this case here, again, we want these critical sections to be as short as possible. Right? So it's better off just saying, I can't get it, boom, don't restart. Then try to do something way more complicated. Yes? Two, two writers are going in opposite directions. Do they have to work that? Like... So this question is, if two writers are trying to go in, in both directions, if at the exact moment they try to get the right latch on the other direction, then yes, they would both restart. But you know, in, if you think about it, in, in practice, one's going to be slightly behind the other. So the, the, the first guy would try can't get it, he kills himself, the second guy would then be able to get the latch. All right? But it can happen. So again, the, the main thing I, I, want, I want to emphasize here is we don't need to be smart. We don't need to be clever. Just be super simple. And that's actually going to turn out to be the, the most, most efficient way to actually implement this. And we can have, um, you know, sort of the question he was, he was, he was the, the, the suggestion he had was, Oh well, I can look to see that thread one sees that thread two is waiting for me. Therefore, I I, I can maybe kill him or, or give him a hint about something. I have to store that somewhere. I could store that now in my node to say, hey, here's the list of threads that are waiting for you. But now I'm storing that instead of actual data, right? Because that needs to be a variable size. Because I, I, who knows how many threads could be accessing this? So as far as I know, nobody does this. Everyone just does something really simple. Yes. So uh, when they restart. So his question is, uh, when I say a, th if a thread kills himself, this guy dies, and he restarts, is he going to, uh, is this thread going to just maybe wait a little bit and then retry, or just try it right again? Depends on the implementation. Right? So you can do like a, um, a standard technique would be what's called sort of exponential back off. It's like TP, you know, uh, TCP, right? So I, I try right away. If I know that I've restarted twice, then maybe the next time I'll wait half a millisecond, and then maybe a millisecond, two milliseconds, and so forth. Yeah, I think it's better things. If you don't stop for a while, it, it might be, there might be it's, it's such a situation that forever that lock, restart, restart forever. Yeah, so, yeah, so his, his statement is, um, uh, it, it, I mean, it's a possibility your thread could get starved. That no matter how many times it tries, it can never get it done. Absolutely, yes. Again, we'll see this in, tra in transactions with locks. And there's a way to handle this by, because now we have some global information about what, what transactions are running. You can do things like give priority to, to the oldest time, the you know, transaction with the oldest timestamp. Like, it, you know, this, so we can, I was sort of joking about, like in this case here, when I decided, should I wait or should I kill myself or kill him? Transactions with locking will do will make those decisions. In this case here, we just we don't want to do any coordination. We just kill ourselves immediately. Yes. What if T1 is now a read lock and then T2 is now a read lock? Our question is, say T1 is a read lock on C, T2 has a write lock on this. What should happen? Uh, in, in, in read mode? In write mode. In write mode? So like, write mode potentially have higher uh, Her question is, do, 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 do threads that want to get latches in write mode have higher preference to latches in read mode? Again, like you, um, you'd have to have some kind of coordination mechanism to make that kind of decision, right? Because in this case here, all you know at this point here is that this thing is in write mode, and that's it. Right? You don't know that this guy's trying to come over here and get this in, in read mode or some other mode. Right? You just say, I can't get it. I just kill myself right away. The most simplest thing actually turns out to be the best. All right, yes, more. Okay, 
So his statement is, uh, why is retrying better than just waiting? So the, the way I would rephrase it is not waiting indefinitely, but waiting with a timeout. So you could, in theory, say, all right, I think this guy's going to give it up, which is probably true. So maybe I'll just spin for a millisecond. And then I, if I get it, great. If not, I restart. You could do it that way. But in the end, like you, you, and it's, it's, in that case, again, you're, you're, you're deadlocked for that one millisecond until you time out. Right? You're blocked. You're not, right? Yeah, so, so again, be very careful. You could, you can wait. There, there could be a deadlock, but you need a timeout because you don't want to wait forever. Because again, the, the, with latches, there's no like, like God in the clouds that come down and say, "Oh, you guys are deadlocked. Let me fix this." Right? We don't have that here. We have that for, for transaction locks, which we'll again we'll cover this later. We don't have here. We have nothing. Right? We're like driving a car without a seatbelt. Right? So we could have this guy spin on on this latch. For one millisecond, if he gets it, great. If not, abort and restart. Right? That, that, that would work as well. That's, that's still correct. But again, for that one millisecond, if we have a deadlock, we're, we're doing nothing. Right? And again, it's more like in this simple example, it's only a two level tree, right? So there's only, I only have one latch here. But like, if he's modifying a bunch of crap, I may hold a bunch of right latches above me, and that's blocking everybody else. So again, you could be more sophisticated and say, all right, well, I, I'm, this guy here has a right latch and I have like five right latches above me and therefore I, I want to go this way and I can't get it, so I, I should abort right away because I released a bunch of latches. Or if I know I only have one right latch, then eh, who cares? Then nobody else is blocked behind me, so I'll wait for a millisecond. You could do that. It's still, it's still correct. But I'm... Um, what commercial systems do for this, I don't know. I don't, I, actually, I don't know what Postgres does either, or, or MySQL. OK. All right, so again, the, the, the main takeaway of how we're going to handle leaf nodes is that uh, we just do our, this, this, the, 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 the coupling of the crabbing along the leaf nodes. But if we can't get the latch we want, we should just kill ourselves right away, right? Which is different than how we got latches going top down. Going top down, we were allowed to wait because we know there could never be a deadlock. Going left and right, there could be a deadlock. So therefore, uh, to just avoid all this, we just kill ourselves right away. And again, this is, this is us being good programmers, good database developers and system, software engineers that have to design our data structure to be, be thread safe and protected. Right? It's, it's, it's hard to do. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about is a optimization, again, that was invented here at CMU for the B-Link, from the B-Link tree paper, which was from like 1981 or something, or maybe in the 70s, um, by Philip Lehman, who's he's in the dean's office at SCS. So again, the, 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 the only thing you have to really understand about the B-Link tree is that it, it has the pointers, the sibling pointers along the leaf nodes. The original B-plus tree doesn't have that. Every modern implementation has this, this aspect of the B-Link tree. So the observation that they made was that any time that I was going to do an insert, that if I had to split my node, my leaf node, because it overflowed, then at least that I would have to update at least three nodes in my tree, or write to three nodes. So you'd have to write to obviously to the node that you're splitting, then you'd write to the other node that you overflowed into, and you write all its keys into it, and then you have to write into your parent. Or to say, here's the new separator, here's the new key, here's the, here's the pointer to the new leaf node that I just created. You may have to go up further in the tree, but for our purposes now, we, we, can, we can ignore that. So the optimization that they proposed was that uh, any time that a leaf node overflows and you do a split, just delay updating its parent node. Right? Don't take the right latch on it, give it up right away, and this, at some later point, you'll go ahead and update it. And as we'll see in a second, uh, it still guarantees that the that the the, the contents of the of the, the B plus tree is sound and the internal internal representation. So say when you use that example again, where we, we want to insert twenty five. So we do the optimistic lock coupling that we showed before. We take read latches all the way down. 
We get down to C. Again, we still take the read latch, uh, release on B. Now we do the right latch on F, and now we see that we're going to have to do a split. But instead of restarting, uh, which actually we wouldn't have to do in this case here, because actually, yeah, instead of restarting and coming back and get, getting the read latch on C, we just keep, keep going. And then what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and uh, do the split on F. We hold the read latch, sorry, we hold the right latch on it. We can go ahead and do that. No one's going to get to us. And, but we're not going to update C because we don't hold a latch on that. All right, so we, we insert 25, we add the new leaf node, we connect it to our, our, or the sibling pointers, and then we're done. And then now what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to, we're going to post some information in our data structure to say that the next time someone comes along and takes the right latch on C, go ahead and, and add the separator key that we didn't put into it. Right? So at this point here, we, 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 we've inserted 25, we split with 30, we, you know, split off a new node that has 31. At this point here, if any thread comes along and is looking for 25 or 31, it can find it even though we don't have this pointer from C to this new node here, right? If you look at this, if, I want, if I'm looking for 31, I go from 20, I go down this way, 35, I go down this way, 31 is greater than 23, so I go here. And then there's some little information, we, again, we maintain about what the, the, the next sibling key would be. So we would say, all right, well, I know that if I'm scanning along here, that I'm looking for 31, my range for this node F is 23 to 25, but oh, by the way, if you're looking for something greater than from 25, um, but less than 35, go over and follow this node here. So I can still find 31 if I'm looking for it. I just didn't do it through C. I just did it by following along, scanning along the leaf nodes. And again, I do that leaf node scan crabbing that we talked about before. So now at some, at some later point, some other thread comes along and say it wants to do an update, and it comes down here. Uh, Get read latch on B, and then it knows that there's a pending update for C that needs to be applied, it can go ahead and acquire C in uh, right, right latch mode. So then, and when it comes there, it says, all right, now actually I can post my new separator to key 31 and have it point to the, the new page that the other guy created. Right? The idea here is, again, that we want to we delay having our update, because otherwise we'd have to do the restart and acquire the, the right latch. But we can if we come back the second time, we can kind of acquire the right latch on C and actually do the update. Right, it's, it's pretty obvious op optimization. Um, I actually, I don't know how common this is, um, but it, it does appear in the literature uh, for a lot of times when people talk about B plus trees, at least the modern variants of them. Okay, so any questions about latch crabbing or coupling in B plus trees? Yes, in the back. This question is, it's a late update only on insert. Yes. All right. So hopefully I made it sound, well, actually, not hopefully, but hopefully I conveyed to you that uh, at a high level, the protocol of, of making a B plus tree uh, thread safe is easy to understand. But I would say in practice, it's actually very difficult to implement and get correct. Um, now, for the guy, would you guys be implementing in Project Two? You know, you don't have to implement all the various optimizations that we talked about. Right? You can sort of do the straightforward method and going always top down and, and left to right with you know this aborting should be pretty straightforward. Um, the other thing I want to convey also too is that although we described all these mechanisms to protect the data structure in the context of a B plus tree. These higher le high level techniques that we're using here are applicable to all sorts of different types of data structures. Um, right? Think of things like you know, acquiring latches always in, in, the, in the same order to avoid deadlocks, killing yourself right away and restarting, right? All those things you can apply to, uh, to other areas, other facets of computer science with data structures as well. So it's not just, again, it's, yes, we're doing a B plus trees because that's the most common thing in, in databases, but for hash tables, for, for, for red black trees, and display trees and other things, you can do the same kind of thing. Okay? All right, so any questions about latching or crabbing? Perfect. You're all salivating for project two. Okay. Uh, so project two, you guys will be building a, uh, a thread safe B plus tree, again, using the, the latching and crabbing techniques we're talking about here today. 
So the project is broken up into four parts. The first one is, is, is defining the page layout, then you have to build your data structure, then you have to make a, an iterator class, a wrapper around it, and then implement latch crap. Um, so the way this is going to work is that we're going to provide you guys with, again, the scaffolding, the API that you guys have to implement the same way we did for project one, and then you guys just fill in your implementations. And you're free to add whatever additional private classes or private da data structures or, or, or private methods you want inside of your class, but you, the highest level you need to implement the API that we give you. Okay? So the one thing we're doing differently this year is that we're breaking up the project up again into two checkpoints. So the first checkpoint we do October 8th, which I think is a Monday at midnight. Again, you just submit this on Gradescope, and it'll be the sort of the first half of the project. So you implement the page layouts for the internal node and the, 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 the leaf nodes. Um, and you only need to actually support unique keys. We're making it much more simple. You don't have to worry about, uh, I think also we, we don't make you support variable length keys either. Right? Everything we fix lame. And then you start building out your, your B plus tree. And in the first checkpoint, you only need to support search and insert. Right? Insert, you obviously need to, in order to populate it. And then search, is, you just needed to check whether you know, things are there that should be there. Um, so another, another way to think about this is you only need to support inserts with, with splitting and not delete in the first checkpoint. Again, just like before, we'll provide you with some rudimentary test cases to, to evaluate your work. Um, the grade scope one will have more comprehensive uh, tests, but you're also encouraged to write your own. You can build off the, the sort of testing framework that we give you. The first, so this first checkpoint be worth 40% of the grade, and then for the second project, second checkpoint, it's worth 60%, and that's due October 19th, which is a Friday. I think the, the midterm is 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 that Wednesday, the 17th. So this will be due after, after two days after the midterm. So now in the second checkpoint, you have to implement deletion, right, with 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 merging or, or sibling stealing, and then you have to implement uh, an SDL index wrapper or iterator wrapper around your index, and that means you have to do the leaf node scans and make them thread safe. Um, actually, yeah, this, the second checkpoint overall, you have to make everything be thread safe. So you have to do the latch, crabbing, and coupling techniques we're talking about here. And it's up to you to decide whether you want to use the optimistic one or not, or you want to do delayed updates, or whether op other optimization you want to do. It's entirely up to you guys. But then we'll, we'll benchmark you guys on, with the leaderboard and see who actually has the fastest one. Question? Uh, can we just like, always lock the root of the tree? So this question is, can you just always lock the root of the tree? <laughs> First of all, latch the root of the tree. Uh, no. You can do that to start, right? So you could do this for, um, like at this point here, like, like if you could submit it with a single latch for the entire thing. Um, I think, if I remember correctly from the test, I think we have hooks so that uh, we can pause threads in the tests and check to see whether you, you are actually supporting concurrent threads at the same time. So we have things like that where like, instead of like just, you know, Give me a key and then it comes back. We 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 have hooks in the in the in the traversal steps so that maybe we get to like the level two and then we pause and then try to have somebody else come behind you and see whether you actually support concurrent up you know concurrent operations. Right? Because that way you, you know one thread's going down a different path and it should be allowed if one thread is paused inside of it. So that that's what we check from the concurrent index. Okay? All right, some some general development hints I would say is that. The way it's implemented is almost exactly how it's described in the textbook. I think it's chapter 1510. Like the, even like the, it's even down to like the, the method names are exactly what's in the, in the textbook. All right, so you, if you follow that, follow the semantics, that, uh, that'll help you understand things. I had a, one of the TAs took the class last year, and he says like, it, it wasn't until I went and read the textbook on their discussion of B plus tree and crabbing did, it, did the project actually make sense to me. So I encourage you to go do that uh, first before you get started. The other thing you can do also, and we have th this on the project page, uh, you're encouraged to maybe to set your node size to be smaller than four kilobytes. Again, the node size is the page size. But now if you have that, if you have it be four kilobytes, then you have to insert a lot of stuff before it starts splitting and merging, or sorry, before it starts splitting. So if you use a smaller page size, like our node size, like five, 512 bytes, then it doesn't take, it doesn't take very much uh, insertions before it starts splitting. And you can test that to see whether your thing's working correctly. Um, and then the last one also too, and again, this is, this is in the documentation of the project page, you want to make sure that you protect the internal pointer for the root page in your, in your B plus tree. That's the thing that people got fouled up on last year a lot. 
right? If I start doing splits and uh, I update now my, my pointer to my root node, which is represented through this root page ID, then when you come back, you're now pointing to garbage. Okay? All right, so the way you're going to do this is that we're going to give you a new tarball. We'll give you a simple, uh, simple you know, bash command to copy in the files from project one into the new tarball, all right, because it's going to have some updated code. Um, and <coughs> when you submit it, you only want to submit uh, the, the 10 files that you modified plus the six files that from project one. So everything's sort of built, built on top of what you've done before and it is accumulative, okay? And as always, post your questions on Piazza or come to TL plus hours. And then obviously don't, don't, don't cheat. Uh, there are implementations of B plus trees on the internet. You can look at them, you can follow them, but, but copying them into is, your code is not going to help you because it's, it's, the API is different. Um, and don't put anything, don't put any of your code or solutions on GitHub. Okay? All right, any questions? Yes? Wait, say it again, sorry? Yes. For project two? Or project one. Should be today. We'll, we'll, we'll check this. Yeah, the last day is. Um, well, so again, so every day you're late, it's twenty five percent off. So it's it's and you get four late days, so you can submit it at least four late days. Then it's four more days after that before you get a zero. So it's technically eight days to submit it. Okay. Okay, all right, next class, we'll finally actually start looking how to actually execute queries. We've sort of been beating around the bush. We keep saying like, oh, we have queries. They'll come later. We, we, we can read our B plus tree. We can read our, our pages with tuples. Now we're actually talking about actually how to do this. Again, building up the layers in the system, building top of the B plus trees, building part of the buffer pool manager. Now we can run queries, okay? <laughs> That's my favorite all pattern. Uh, <laughs> no. What is it? Yes, it's the SD Cricket IDES. I make a mess unless I can do it like a Geo. Ice Cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here it comes, Duke. I play the game where there's no rules. Homies on the cup say I'm a fool cause I drink fruit. Put the bus a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes. Here I come. Willie D, that's me. Rolling with Fifth Watt, South Park, and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12 pack case of a boy. Six pack 48 gets the real pounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say Bill makes you fat. But St. Isaac's straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>